I'll note I have here is there is a link to the PowerPoint slides, um, and that's also in the note box there, so you can access those um, at your own convenience. And this webinar is being recorded. So like we um, had indicated, a link to the recording will be put onto um, ALA's e-learning site. Um, and that link was sent out along with the link to this meeting room. So you, you can access the recording after the fact as well. All right, so with that being said, I will turn it over to our presenters. Hello, I'm going to speak first. My name is Curtis Small, and I'm a Special Collections Librarian at the University of Delaware Special Collections, and we thank all of you for attending our webinar today, Exploring Careers in Archives and Special Collections. Today, I'm going to be joined by three of my wonderful colleagues. Jose Guerrero is a Penn State a university's librarian in special collections. Nathaniel Moore works at the Freedom Archives as an archivist in San Francisco. And Maria Victoria Fernandez works at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. Now, this webinar, many of you are Spectrum scholars and others, we are aiming it in particular at people of color who are considering going into special collections and archives as a career. So to inspire, hopefully, and attract such people to consider our profession, that's one reason that we decided to hold the webinar. But I'd also like to briefly discuss some of the other reasons behind this webinar. We feel that there is a lack of diversity. Well, it's not what we feel. It's a fact that there is not enough diversity within the special collections and archives field in terms of representation. This relates to issues of hiring and retention in the field, as well as a need for greater awareness regarding the diversity of collections that are held by different institutions, access and discoverability of those collections, description of those collections, that relate in this case to people of color and other underrepresented groups. And we also feel there's a need for greater cultural awareness in the presentation of such materials in the classroom and beyond. So that's another reason that we decided to have this, this webinar today. Now, by way of demonstration in terms of the issue of hiring, I'm sharing racial demographics from the rare book and manuscript section of RBMS. RBMS, some of us on this panel are members, the rare book and manuscript section of ACRL, the Association of College and Research Libraries. RBMS is the largest national organization of special collections librarians, as well as archivists. However, we are a separate organization from SAA, the Society of American Archivists. We have a number of rare book curators in RBMS, public services librarians, archivists, catalogers, and so on. You can see these statistics. They speak for themselves based on member surveys of our BMS uh, members. There was a modest uh, improvement in the representation of non-white members of our BMS, but in 2015, the last member survey, there's still a lot of work to be done. And so part of the reason for this webinar is to try to make a modest, at least this is one modest step to help change the situation in terms of representation in the profession. And these statistics do not address the issue of retention, which is another important issue. What we're going to do today is talk about our job duties with diversity and inclusion and social justice as an implicit part of what we're going to talk about. But some of us are going, we're going to describe uh, aspects of our jobs in order to give people an idea of the types of work being done in the archives and special collections field. I'm going to talk about public services librarianship, and my colleague uh, Jose is going to talk about collection development issues. Nathaniel works in an institution that is not an academic institution, uh, but has strong community relations and documenting of social justice issues. And Maria is going to talk about aspects of digital collections, digital outreach, data, 
as collections of data and so on. So I will begin by talking a little bit about my job. I am a public services librarian. My title is a coordinator of public services in the special collections department at the University of Delaware Library in Newark, Delaware. My job has three major components as a public services librarian. Um, support for researchers, the first one, support, supporting people who use our collections of rare books and manuscripts in the reading room. That you see a researcher from the reading room on the upper left hand corner. We also have a virtual reference, online reference, and as the coordinator, I make sure that these services are handled correctly. You will build the knowledge of the collections in order to be able to help researchers, students, and others who need access, uh, rights and permissions, and the like. As coordinator, I uh, supervise one person, the person who most often staffs our reading room. Another part of my job involves exhibitions. We have four spaces in the library in which rare books, manuscripts are on display at all times. We also have one space that accommodates materials from the circulating collection. Our materials and special collections do not circulate. It is my job to curate along with my colleagues in special collections. We all do curation, but as a coordinator, it's my job to make sure that our exhibition program is planned out and we have no gaps in the program. I'll talk about exhibitions as a form of outreach in a minute. Another important aspect of my job involves instruction or teaching and learning, which is the term that's being used more often now, in a special collections context involving books and manuscripts from our collection. I work with faculty members and students in courses in order to help their learning experience. And I will say here that there is a trend in the special collections and archives toward getting books and archival materials as deeply as possible into the curriculum by working with faculty members to build assignments and entire courses that involve a more sustained use of special collections materials so that the students get more. Uh, they get training, they get um, primary source literacy skills, the ability to conduct research in a more effective way, research with primary sources. These more sustained collaborations are an attempt to build stronger skills than the students would get from a one-time visit to special collections as part of a course. Although those one-shot, one-time visits still happen a lot. But if you enter special collections as an instruction librarian, a public services librarian who does instruction, you will see this trend developing for more sustained collaborations with faculty that will involve repeated visits, for example, to special collections. I'm going to now focus on one of these instructional collaborations that I've been involved with here at the University of Delaware. It began with an exhibition that I curated last fall, drawing on our collections. You can see the poster for that exhibition at the top here, the top right image is in red and black. This ex exhibition was entitled Issues and Debates in African American Literature. And the exhibit, exhibit used books and manuscripts from our collections in order to trace African American literary, cultural, and political debates through the 20th century. Going from debates such as Booker T. Washington's disagreement with W.E.B. Du Bois on the type of education that was appropriate for black people at the turn of the 20th century, on through the Harlem Renaissance, and later, Zora Neale Hurston's debate with Richard Wright over the role of black literature in, the, in, the, in society, and on into the 20th and 21st century, this exhibit that I had curated. Now, at that time, before the exhibit opened, a new faculty member in the English department, who also happens to be a historian of the African American book history, she decided that she wanted to integrate this exhibit that I had curated independent of her, but she wanted to make it a major part of a new course that she was teaching here at the University of Delaware. So as the semester was starting, we collaborated and we developed uh, a program to involve the students 
in work in archives around the exhibition. So this began with students visiting the exhibition uh, African on African American literature. Here's the exhibition hall, the exhibition gallery in the upper right hand corner, our largest exhibition space. The students visited, they had a tour, they had a lecture in which I introduced them to some of the themes and topics and texts that the exhibit examines, including some information on African American print culture, print culture and book history. And after that, the students came back to Special Collections a number of times to develop research topics that were related to the exhibit, but not ident identical. And at the end of the semester, the students gave presentations in the Special Collections Gallery, where my exhibit was still on display. They presented their own research that expanded and extended the original exhibition. To give one example of a student research, the original exhibit the original exhibit in part traces the importance of blues music as a template for African-American literature and cultural politics. As exemplified in texts such as Langston Hughes' first volume of poetry, The Weary Blues, we had a first edition of that volume on display, up through Angela Davis's book on black women as blues artists written in the early 90s, and she and many other artists and thinkers look back to Langston Hughes as a model for the incorporation of a blues aesthetic into African-American culture. That was what my exhibit dealt with somewhat. Uh, this particular student in the class, after doing his research, decided to do research on the uh, cultural impact of jazz. So after doing his research in special collections, he presented at the end of the semester on a jazz composition by the artist Max Roach that was political in nature, We Will Not Wait, it's called, and that came, was written and produced during the time of the Black Power Movement, the Black Arts Movement and Literature, which my original exhibit covered, but I did not work on jazz. So this is an example of how the, my work was extended by the students and other students during that presentation at the end did work on black feminist, on black feminist, uh, for example, black feminist um, theory and other topics. In their final presentations, the, two, the students in this class sought to situate the specific text, music, and issues that they were working on in the context of the African American intellectual tradition of thought and debate. And as a librarian and teacher, I attempted to point both patrons and the students who were visiting my exhibit toward the nuance and the richness that characterized African-American liter literary and cultural history. And I found this a, a exciting project because I got to do that. However, I do not mean to imply that special collections of librarians of color, if you're entering the field, necessarily need to specialize in materials from your own racial and ethnic background. I think you should do that if that's where your passion lies and it's in part where mine lies, but I encourage people to work in areas, whatever areas of interest to you, and I think you will enhance the profession doing that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this next collaboration. However, I am now developing a course with the same professor that will be built around a collection of Langston Hughes ephemera and the students in this class this fall, still under development, are going to create a digital collection based on these digitized materials based on Langston Hughes' uh, readings and performances during his career, and they're going to curate a library exhibition, uh, and so on. Now, I have talked briefly about public service work in reference, instruction, exhibitions. I am not a archivist. I do not process collections. I do not uh, engage in work with collection development, acquiring materials at this time. However, my colleague Jose Guerrero does work in this very vitally important aspect of our work, um, curation and acquisition. And I'm now going to pass the mic to Jose. Uh, th thanks a lot, Curtis, uh, for that uh, lovely overview of your work. Um, many great things going on at at Delaware, and um, so as Curtis said, I will um, be speaking a bit about um, sort of the work of a curator in a, the special collections libraries, um, in particular at my institution, but I'm hoping uh, some of these are things that 
uh, will make you consider this as a, uh, a, a viable career path, but um, also think about the kind of curatorial issues that you may be facing with, um, that, that you may be faced with at your own institutions or at uh, future uh, places where you may uh, work. So uh, just to kind of give a, a brief overview of uh, what I'll be talking about today, um, it, it, it's quite often that I've come across a sort of um, false distinction that's been made uh, between um, work around collections and work around building community. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that uh, collections and community are not two uh, separate things necessarily. Uh, in fact, I would argue that one can't really exist without the other. Right? Um, you have uh, communities of writers and communities of activists and uh, communities of various uh, you know, social political agents who really gather around the objects that they produce or the objects that they use. Right, And as special collections librarians and archivists, our sort of job is to preserve those things and make them accessible to other people interested in them. Um, and so um, I, I think the statement that embodies that most is this, this idea that publics gather around matters of concern, right? And so in this case, a matter of concern is not just a sort of conceptual thing. It's, you know, matter means also something physical, right? It means an object. Um, and lastly, I'll be discussing a little bit about how to acquire some of these materials. Um, and certainly in, a, in an academic library uh, context, uh, there's really only two ways to acquire materials, and that's through donation and through purchase. So uh, that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, I will be talking mostly about working with dealers, uh, just because I think that's another kind of underexplored area where community among uh, dealers and librarians have been very important in creating uh, meaningful collections. So to give you a little bit of background of sort of where, where I'm situated in, I'm at the University Park campus of uh, Penn State University, which is in central Pennsylvania. Um, a rural college town setting um, with about 40,000 students, that's undergraduate and graduate student body. Um, our special collections contain rare books, manuscripts, uh, a large accumulation of uh, archives of, uh, related to labor history. Um, we are, for example, the repository for the United Steelworkers of America's uh, organizational records. Um, and we are, of course, also home to uh, the university archives, which uh, documents the history of Penn State University from its founding in 1855 to the present day. Um, and some of my own sort of day-to-day -day duties include instruction. Um, as Curtis said, um, I've worked with faculty to uh, create, um, you know, uh, to, to design visits of classes around particular materials and particular topics. I've also worked on curating exhibitions in a special collections uh, context. Um, I think my primary duty at the moment is uh, collection development. You know, this is sort of the thing that I'm most absorbed in at the moment. Um, I also liaise with uh, technical services um, and also public services, right? So uh, I'm sort of in charge of giving some direction and guidance to catalogers, sort of what aspects of materials that need to be included in the catalog records. Um, but I also have a turn at the reference desk, right? I have weekly shifts. So I'm also sort of uh, really um, at that point where the user comes in and requests something and uh, you know maybe has a question about our collections, wants to know if we have a particular thing. I'm also there to answer those questions. That's part of my, 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 my responsibilities at my job. Um, and so I think it, it warrants mentioning sort of how I got here a little bit. Um, so my MLIS is from Wayne State University, and I mention that only because, you know, for those of you who may still be in library school or who may have recently graduated, um, you know, it, it, I, I, a, a big part of, you know, how I, I, I got this um, position was uh, through relationships I developed with, with faculty at, at uh, Wayne State. Uh, so those are very important relationships to maintain as well. Um, I've also uh, benefited a great deal from the IMLS RBS Fellowship. Uh, which was offered um, a couple years ago. Um, and I also received a scholarship to go to the Colorado Antiquarian Book Seminar, which may be off the beaten track a little bit for most librarians, but uh, I, I think it's uh, really well worth the time um, and really connects you with a lot of people who may have similar interest in you know, cultural heritage preservation. Um, and while it focuses on the book trade a great deal, um, it's also been a great source for me in sort of making some connections that have helped me succeed in this job. Um, and there will be more, of course, uh, sort of opportunities listed a little later on. So uh, I want to talk about one of the projects that I've been working on. 
Uh, Penn State is the repository for the library and personal papers of Luis Alberto Sanchez, who is a um, South American intellectual. Um, and uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, this collection was microfilmed. Um, and sort of one of the impetuses for microfilming this collection was um, that um, it would help to diversify the collections at Penn State, right? Um, and something quite curious happened where uh, the materials microfilmed um, that were given this sort of statement that you see highlighted in red, Luis Alberto Sanchez's collection on microfilm, did not have a Sanchez provenance. And so um, on the far left side, you see the, the Sanchez book plate, which was given to Sanchez books. Um, in the middle, there is a catalog record for one of these items, which is microfilmed, microfilmed as a Sanchez book. On the right, you see the book plate that appears in the actual book when you go to consult it. Um, it's an entirely different book plate with an entirely different custodial history. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a Sanchez book. And so uh, one of my sort of projects has been to kind of tease through this collection and try to correctly attribute Sanchez provenance where that is warranted. Um, and sort of part of what motivates this work and what it has to do with sort of curatorial work is that um, as Michael Suarez, the, the director of uh, the Rare Book School at University of Virginia in Charlottesville likes to say, um, he, he's keen to point out that at the root of the word curator is the Latin word uh, curare, which means to care, right? So curated job is, is to care, and I think stewarding our existing collections is a big part of that job of, um, of, of, of caring for, for, for these materials of historical significance. Um, similarly, um, I'm interested in uh, you know building meaningful collections, and a, a, a way to do this is to uh, develop relationships with dealers. And so you might be wondering what uh, relationships with dealers have to do with uh, things like black studies programs in the 1970s. Um, it turns out quite a bit. Um, in 1968, a student organization at Penn State made a number of demands of the university's administration. Among these demands was um, that a section of the library be devoted exclusively to black authors um, and that there be more black literature offered in the university's English courses. Um, and so that was in 1968. And a little over a decade later, there's an established black studies program. Um, and the underlined uh, class listing you see is actually taught by the former curator of books, Charlie Mann. It's literature of the British Commonwealth, which included a great deal of primary sources on uh, Caribbean literature. And so the way that Charlie built this collection is uh, by tapping into uh, one of his uh, contacts, Walter Goldwater, Goldwater, who ran University Place Bookshop, which uh, was one of the early antiquarian book dealers to specialize in uh, material from um, um, uh, material related to the African uh, diaspora. Um, and so here we have an invoice, you know, which kind of shows like this is like the the process by which these collections were built up, which were necessary to establish these kinds of programs. Um, and on the right hand side here, you see a letter um, which uh, has to do with a sort of contact among the faculty that uh, Charlie had, another way that uh, he, he worked to develop these collections. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is just as true today as it was in the 70s. Um, if we want to uh, think about emerging collecting areas, um, it helps to, to know people who might uh, be in contact with these materials as our faculty are and as um, our book dealers are. So uh, even with a very modest budget, uh, Charlie was able to assemble quite a formidable uh, collection enough to support uh, an entire academic program, um, w w which is quite remarkable, I believe. Um, uh, another way that uh, these sort of, um, you know, um, the, the university moved along um, it, its project to expand its offerings was by actually subscribing to material as it was being released. So these are two issues of uh, El Malcriado, which is a sort of a farm workers uh, serial, which was published out of Delano, California. Um, and if you look at the sort of addresses, uh, you see that uh, Penn, the Penn State Labor Education Program um, subscribed directly to this, right? So this is something else that can still be done today. You know, we can still subscribe to uh, materials from uh, social movements and uh, groups that are uh, active in uh, the fight for social justice um, and uh, economic uh, equality. Um, so just to kind of uh, sign off a bit here, um, I wanted to end with some resources. 
or kind of tips and things um, that if you uh, are interested in uh, curatorial work, these are some things to keep in mind. Um, of course, know your colleagues, um, and it, this includes uh, people in the acquisitions department, uh, technical services, your catalogers, the people who you're ordering, um, and your subject specialists too, right? Your, 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 your colleagues in the library who liaise with particular departments. Um, and I would count uh, antiquarian book dealers as colleagues as well. Um, I would encourage you, whenever possible, to visit book fairs. Certainly, if you have curatorial responsibilities uh, as your job, you know, there is a strong case to be made for uh, attending book fairs. And the antiquarian book fairs can be found on this URL. Um, visiting bookshops is another great way to learn about what's available um, and to ask if it's possible to collect in a particular area. Um, and you can learn more about book dealers at abaa.org. That's the website of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Um, you can learn a lot by just reading the catalogs that these dealers issue. Um, and to that end, I'd encourage you to sign up for the Ex Libris Listserv, uh, which every Tuesday produces a slew of dealer catalogs. Um, and there's also interesting conversations around curatorial work and rare books um, during the rest of the week as well. Um, and lastly, it's, it's good to know your institutional history, not just because um, you need to know your collections if you're doing curatorial work, uh, but also because learning about you know, what you have, I think, will help us to better steward uh, these materials for the future um, and will help us to, um, to, to, to fulfill that essential job responsibility of the curator, which is to care. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Nathaniel Moore. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks so much. It's really great to be here, and I am really uh, optimistic about all the wonderful work that my fellow presenters are doing and that there are so many people who signed up for the, uh, the webinar. Um, can I turn up my microphone? Maybe I can turn up. Can I just talk louder? Is that better? Um, okay, great. Uh, and I'll try to figure out how to do that while I'm talking. Um, and so uh, I'm coming from a little bit of a different place. And so what I'm going to do is do something just a little different. Um, I'm not at an academic institution. I work at the Freedom Archives. We're a small community archive in, located in San Francisco. Uh, there are two staff members, myself as the archivist, and then the director, who is one of the founders. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that we do and kind of different ways that we can think about uh, integrating aspects of social justice and liberatory politics into our practice inside of these spaces. So that's one thing I'm going to do. And then the other thing I'm going to try to do in the very short amount of time that I'm going to be talking is uh, talk a little bit about knowledge production, because I think that um, one thing people oftentimes leave out of the conversation when we talk about the fields of librarianship or archives or rare books and manuscripts is how important to the way knowledge is produced to these spaces are. And when I look at the statistics that Curtis uh, showed, um, I think um, that that can be really indicative of the current political context to see those numbers and then wonder why things are the way they are. So I want to speak to that and think about ways that we in the field can kind of challenge some of those things. Um, and so at the Freedom Archives, the work that we do is um, basically our, our motto is preserve the past, illuminate the present, and shape the future. And um, kind of to talk about the work we do is basically we are an archive uh, where we preserve materials from different social movements from the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, we create educational materials using these archival materials that make connections between historical events and things that are happening today. Um, and then um, and then we also um, try to shape the future. And so that part of that is the uh, materials that we make, and part of that is like maintaining our internship program, doing outreach, and collaborating on projects. Um, okay, and so that's some of the work that we do. And because uh, I'm one of two employees, I end up doing a lot of stuff. Um, 
So these are the founders. And the reason why I want to um, reference the founders is because uh, in some ways, um, none of this would be possible without them. And then also because by understanding a little bit about them, it kind of shapes the work we do. So all of these folks were involved in progressive radio journalism in the 1960s and 70s. And most of their work was considered, um, let's just call it undervalued by the mainstream media or by um, uh, certain more mainstream political movements because it was talking about issues of anti-imperialism, about political prisoners and prisoner-led organizing, um, self-determination movements both internally inside the United States as well as internationally. Um, and so because of the content that they were covering and the politics that they were analyzing with it, oftentimes this was left out of the mainstream narrative. And so these folks just decided to keep uh, what was at the time mostly reel-to-reel -reel recordings. They just held on to them because the radio station that they were working at or different spaces that they were creating the media in uh, were not going to value it. And through doing that, many, many years passed, but in uh, the end of 1999 and into 2000, these folks pulled that material together, and that was the original iteration of the archives. Um, so in addition to telling the story about the history, also these folks were young people you know, in their 20s when they were creating this work. So part of the kind of um, internalized, one of the internalized values of the Freedom Archive is to value and lift up youth engagement with the politics. Because again, that's how these materials were originally created, and that's how we see that we can empower people to help uh, change the society that we're living in. So that's a big part of what our mission is, and that's why I'm going to talk about the internship program we have uh, and use that as a way to talk about some of the work we do. Um, the other reason why I want to do this is oftentimes in academic settings, we may also have access to student employees or work with young people. And so even though the conditions will look a little different, perhaps some of these things can be um, applicable in the settings that you might be working in. Um, so I apologize for the folks who can't read this because um, I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing, but part of uh, the main cores of our internship program is to shape it around specific students, their interests, and their goals. And so we don't have a blueprint where every single individual who comes into the archive gets the same projects and the same interaction. Um, we want to specifically work with young people to explore their own history, to lift up their own um, aspirations for how they want to engage the materials and develop their own skill sets. And at the end of the day, we want to all ground that in uh, questions and exploration and empowering students to create their own narrative as opposed to um, just be shaped by, say, what's in a history book, which is just a slice of, in fact, what actual history looks like. Um, in terms of what the actual internship program looks like, um, we try to develop reading, writing, critical thinking skills. People actually work with preserving the materials. Um, they may digitize old reel-to-reels into audio uh, clips and put it into Pro Tools and pull sound bites. Um, and at the end of the day, we want to um, do all this to help encourage people to uh, enjoy history and see it as something that they're a part of creating as opposed to just something that they read in a book and have no connection to. Um, just a couple quick pictures of uh, what some of the archives look like in some of the reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Um, so a couple things that um, the interns have actually done is um, some interns created one of our first productions called The Vinyl Project, where they basically did a survey of all of our reel-to-reel -reel recordings, digitized certain ones, and pulled sound bites that they thought were interesting that could then be repurposed for use in spoken word and um, other uh, formats. Um, we've had people produce uh, video and um, uh, leaflets about how to locate and address people who are locked up which is a huge problem in California. Many of our young people have people who are behind bars. And so how to uh, encourage those relationships. And then we've had young people create countless classroom curricula, um, 
digitize archival collections, uh, create online timelines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to have time to get into it, but you can uh, look at all of our stuff on our website at freedomarchives.org or at search.freedomarchives.org, which is our digital search engine. Um, so I'm coming towards the general end of my presentation. I have a couple more minutes left, so I wanted to just read a quote that somebody used to talk about their experience at the archives, which I thought was useful to put it into perspective. And I'll just read this for those people who uh, can't see the slide. There is a profound power in hearing, reading, and seeing these marginalized history and narratives directly. It wasn't hard to get lost down the rabbit hole that is the archives, that's for sure. I felt privileged and humbled to actually hear the voices of resistance fighters, read through meeting notes on the work of artists to combat imperialism, or view art and posters of resistance and justice. It makes me imagine a parallel universe. What if a core part of our public education system was just to let all students lose an archive like these? What would happen? Uh, how would students become more curious, more critical? How would minds be liberated? What movements would form? What fights? And what would the future of our country and world be transformed? And how would the future of our country and world be transformed? These typically erase histories, legacies, knowledge. They are vital. I hope that, like me, uh, more people find their way here to the archives, making that parallel universe a little bit more of a reality. Um, and so I think that spirit is something that, as people in our position, we should try to instill in all the people that engage our, our, our collections, especially young people, again, to try to lift up some of these perspectives that are so often ignored in more mainstream spaces that they may be in. Um, so as I come to my conclusion, I just want to comment on a couple lessons very quickly to share, and that maybe we can come back to in the question and answer if there's time. Uh, part of my work and our work, and I think our work as a community, demystify who makes history, libraries, archives, intellectual spaces, and challenge accepted notions of power and knowledge production. Um, remember that all skill sets are transferable, so I'm saying this to you. Even if you don't end up working in archives or special collections, how can we center empowerment, community engagement, and challenge systems oppression in all the work that we do, both in content and in practice? Um, and then building community is vital to power. So things like this are really important. And I would second that networking and building community, even if you're not, even if you don't end up in this field, is really useful. Um, and with that, I want to throw it to Maria, who's going to talk a little bit about special collections and digital scholarship. Um, thank you folks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so, so much for, um, for the wonderful presentation to my colleagues. Um, and I want to kind of, um, well, first, yeah, my, I'm currently an appreciator for digital outreach at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown. Um, I'm relatively new to this position, having started this past spring. And before this, um, I'm a newly minted uh, graduate student from the University of Texas at Austin, School of Information and the um, Latin American Studies program. And I'm going to talk briefly about some of my central responsibilities in, in my position, um, but also share my thoughts broadly speaking about the intersection of special collections and digital scholarship. Um, as an early career professional, I'm deeply interested in this flourishing and ever-growing area within the field of library and information science, and I would like to share some of the opportunities that are available in this area of the profession. I think this will definitely resonate with several current and recent library school students, since our generation has definitely felt the pressure to be able to do all things digital for the institutions that seek to hire new graduates. Um, so a little bit about the work I do. The John Carter Brown Library is an independent research library located at Brown, uh, whose rare books, manuscripts, and map collections encompass a variety of topics related to the history of the Americas from the European arrival in the, uh, in the Americas through the midpoint of the 19th century. Its collection strengths are the history of, of particularly the history of European discovery, exploration, settlement, and development of the Western Hemisphere until the mid 1800s. So the way I think about it is all things colonial. Um, and my main role at the library is to broaden public engagement and understanding of the materials from our collections through Wikipedia and focusing on digital engagement and curation. Um, I'm, um, this library has um, dedicated itself, uh, has dedicated itself to um, digitizing its entire collection 
um, it, and, and making them accessible uh, via the Internet Archive. And um, over the past decade um, and, and moving forward, it's continued to digitize. And um, this is a, a movement that you'll see within special collections is a lot of, uh, a lot of libraries are, are, are getting materials up online into um, their databases. And, and one of the things is, how do we get our materials into the hands of the public? And right now, um, I'm in, in my role focusing with uh, broadening, pu broadening public engagement through Wikipedia is identifying points of engagement between curators, academics, and the broader Wikipedia community to bring the subject expertise of the academic research community here at the John Carter Brown Library and universities at large in higher education to improve the vital universal knowledge hub that is Wikipedia. And thinking about collections and communities and thinking about how we can better public knowledge and public access to materials. Um, and by integrating this digitized media from our collections, editing our, our articles, and incorporating citations and references to both primary and secondary sources, the library is seeking to get our materials out there to support free public knowledge and create access points to our collections. And this is um, part of a wider movement within galleries, libraries, archives, and museums um, called GlamWiki, that institutions are creating partnerships with the Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia Foundation um, to figure out how we can, um, how we can serve um, public understanding and, and meet people where they are and help them find um, uh, materials. So I'm going to use an example of um, when we think about colonial materials and things like that, um, there's a, uh, when, when we, we go into Wikipedia and we find lesser known individuals um, that aren't in the mainstream colonial nar narratives that we can think about. And so, for instance, um, Georges Biazou, who was an early leader of the slave rising in Saint-Domingue that began the Haitian Revolution, um, he's a very important figure. Um, within the historical record of Caribbean history, of, of, of revolution, um, of, of global movements, right? Um, but when we see a, a Wikipedia article about him, and that those, our library as well as other special collections have um, lots of, of, of primary sources uh, documenting, you know, these historical events, and we see that um, there's, you know, two external links to sources, um, not much engagement with secondary literature, and how, how can our collections um, in our library, um, bring uh, more sources, um, more depth um, to how we represent um, um, important historical figures, but also those that are um, in our collections that are missing or underrepresented in Wikipedia. And this is a broader issue within Wikipedia, Wikipedia and, and encyclopedic knowledge, right, where we see that um, that who um, that there's a disproportional amount of biographies. Um, of men, there is uh, across his, all historical periods, um, the vast majority of Wikipedia editors are, are also men, um, and um, and these types of, of contracts within both the Wikipedia community and, and, and broader societal representations of history are really important that the library is engaging with. So, I want to also now talk to the, the idea that the, uh, coming out of library schools, there's a lot of emphasis on digital skill sets whether it's digital archiving, database management, um, engaging with, um, um, with, it, with collections programmatically. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities at the intersection of, of special collections and digital scholarship. Um, for instance, there's things like the, the, the type of work that I'm doing with digital engagement and curation. Um, there is the preservation and digital asset management. When you have, when libraries are not just dealing with their, their physical collections, but also the uh, dealing with the information assets of the images of this material, how do we deal with it? Um, and um, there's a lot to, to be done um, and, and opportunities in this area. And one of the really exciting parts is how can we expand computational use of digitized cultural heritage collections to help um, academics, the general public, engage with our materials in, in new ways. Um, and that brings me to a wonderful um, movement within um, libraries at large and in special collections of, about interrogating and treating our collections as data, where a lot of um, 
a, a lot of work is being done by all these institutions to get their materials digitized. And how can we put these, uh, these digitized materials in conversation with one another um, to broaden access, to um, expand research possibilities? And there's a wonderful um, movement um, going on right now and project uh, that's funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services um, called um, the Collections of Data Project that's led by Thomas Badija, um, currently at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, um, that aims to foster a strategic approach to developing, describing, and providing access to reusing collections to support computationally driven research. And when we think about data, uh, digital uh, aggregated collections um, like the DPLA or Hathi Trust that have, you know, thousands of libraries contributing um, data and, and, and materials and making an access point for people. There's a lot of opportunities in this sphere of special collections. Um, and one, one, one idea um, that's important is that putting these, 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 in all this information in communication with, with one another. Um, and so we, we can think of um, the Social Networks and Archival Context project that was trying to, that is, you know, um, is tr trying to use linked open data to put different collections in different institutions in communication with one another. But then, you know, as we do all this material, uh, all of this analysis, we realize that, um, that some voices are stronger than others in these connections and, you know, the, the, the representation which in, in digitized collections um, generally um, there's a there's a, a tendency to, to show some of the issues that we have in archives, which uh, in, in physical archives, right, where we we have a lot of material of of great white men, um, and when you you know go through this this um, the social networks and archival context, uh, um, we see this come to the fore in a visual way, um, and so it's talking about kind of issues within our our profession. Um, but how we can get, how we can start approaching these issues as well and, and correcting them when we're in these digital spaces. And so with that, um, I'm going to transition to talk about lots of opportunities that are available um, within at the, um, that are available for uh, learning opportunities and, and professional development. So I'm going to turn it to Curtis, so feel free to take it away. Okay, I uh, may have to move quickly here, but I suppose I'll just start off this last part by making the point that in my opinion and probably the opinion of my colleagues, I think this has come through in our presentations, some of the most important assets to us in our careers are the people and the networks of people that you can meet as you take advantage of different learning opportunities and other, 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 wherever it is that you can make contact with like-minded people who can support you in your learning, in your, in your work, in, 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 in any way possible to sustain you in this career. Some of us are members of the Rare Book and Manuscript section. I am the co-chair of the Diverse Committee at this time, and I have a couple of other committee members here on this panel. The Rare Book and Manuscript section, RBMS, I talked about earlier, as you can see in the top image there, is not an organization that was really set up with the needs of people of color in mind. However, there have been changes in the organization, and it is becoming, for now, I will say at least, in my five years in the profession, a place that is more open to different voices, and we've had changes in leadership. Women of color, for example, who have been instrumental in making changes in the organization. Our conferences are more diverse because of our scholarship program. And right here, here's a list and some bullet points I won't get into, some of the activities that the RBMS supports in terms of professional standards and practices. But I will point people toward our scholarship program as a way of being able to attend the conference, become involved in RBMS, and benefit the community by your presence. Our most recent conference was much more diverse than any of the others I've attended because of our scholarship program in which uh, diversity, mem being a member of an, of an underrepresented group, was a criterion for selection. And we pushed to have things like this happen in the profession. 
And we're also going to be revising our website. So that image you see at the top there, which may not be very welcoming when you first go to the RBMS page, we're going to be making suggestions about how to make our website more open and, and suggestive of inclusivity. Very quickly, though, I want to talk about a project that has come out of our diversity committee of RBMS and to point people toward this set of interviews and oral histories, RBMS diversity stories. Here is a partial screenshot. Some of, of our wonderful colleagues here who have told their stories about how they came into Archives and Special Collections and advice on navigating the uh, profession. You have some leaders in RBMS who are re represented here in the upper right uh, at the top. Uh, uh, Petrina Jackson was the main organizer of our most recent conference in which diversity figured very, very large. This is actually a crowdsourced uh, project, so anybody who wants to, who's working in special collections, can add his or her own story or their own story to our site. I can give information about that later if people have questions. I think we're going to have to move right into our question and answer period, or do we have a couple more minutes? Um, it is up to you, but we only have eight minutes left until the end of the hour. Well, what I'm going to do is invite people to uh, look at these slides. Uh, this, this is a recorded uh, program, and these slides will be avail available that point you toward other resources for learning and for this most important aspect of networking and meeting some of the wonderful people in this profession who can sustain you and help and help you. I don't really have anything more to say uh, in this part if anybody yeah, else wants to jump in. Yeah. If not, um, so then finally, yeah. Um, not, not only is there RBMS, but there's several um, other um, sections of ALA that you can um, learn more about if you're interested in things about preservation and reformatting. Um, look into um, Alex, which um, has a section about uh, preservation and conservation. Then we have the Association of Research Libraries, the Society of American Archivists, Archivists um, who also do a lot of conference um, programming and um, uh, conference attended scholarships, as well as if you're still in library school, that have wonderful um, programs to support you, um, both financially with leadership programs um, to get you through school. Um, and if you're interested in, in pursuing um, archives um, as a, a, for the doctoral uh, research or, or continuing in higher education, um, definitely check out um, ARIA, the Archive Education and Research Institute. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, I'll just repeat that programs like Spectrum Scholars, the ARL Initiative to Recruit a Diverse Workforce, the Minnesota Institute for Early Career Librarians, Librarians, which is for early career people, uh, another professional development geared toward people from under, underrepresented groups, uh, as well as mentorship programs that are offered by Spectrum and other organizations. I would recommend as a, as a really important way to get those networks. Somebody told me early on at one of these programs uh, when I was an ARL uh, uh, person in that program to find some people who were your safe space and be a safe space to somebody else. He was speaking particularly in our profession, I think it's true in life. Despite all the training and learning you can do, it's the people that you meet who can help sustain you uh, in this path. So I just want to emphasize that some of these resources are ways to build those kind of networks and relationships. Yeah, and so with that, um, we want to thank everyone and reiterate that please um, if, uh, feel free to, to, to reach out to us if you have interest in, in uh, any of, of, of our work or, or ideas. Um, and um, if, if we can't get to th things in the Q&A session, um, we want to continue the conversation elsewhere. So with that, um, let's move to the Q&A. Um, if... <laughs> we have five minutes. <laughs> But it was, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much um, to all of you for um, your presentation. And at this point, um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat box, and we'll try to answer um, ones we can in the next couple of minutes. So it looks like we have a couple already. Um, 
All right, so um, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, Diana Myers is asking, what advice do you have for undergraduates committed to social justice who are considering starting an MLIS degree in the next couple of years? This is Nathaniel. Um, I would just say to definitely have conversations with other people of color who are in the field. Library school can be very, very challenging. I did not particularly have positive experiences in library school around many different aspects of my experience. So I'm not necessarily telling you not to do it, but I am saying you should know what you are doing and um, just to talk with people so that you are as best prepared for the experience as possible. And I appreciate this piece for the networking that allows, that kind of facilitates that. Um, th this is Jose. I, I, I definitely agree with what Nathaniel said to uh, talk to people. Uh, and I would also say to read widely. Um, you know, uh, 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 there are certainly some perspectives missing um, in the typical library school curricula. And I would say, you know, read outside of librarianship. You know, read a lot of the uh, literature that's, uh, you know, based on social justice and, uh, you know, current and historical movements and the like. So read widely would be my thing I'd add to that. Uh, I, I would I would quickly say once again it's it's about relationships. There are people who are very invested in social justice, and some of them, um, if you look at sources like Inside the Library, the journal Inside the Library with the Lead Pipe, go to Twitter and the crit the 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 Facebook group and the Twitter group we hear. Uh, is made up of librarians, people of color, and many of them very involved in social justice uh, activism and integrating their work. I, too, did not have a wonderful experience in library school. However, it's through those networks that where, where you meet people. Uh, uh, CritLib, the CritLib hashtag on Twitter. Uh, if you haven't already begun looking into these different fora, I would say to do so and, and, and be on the lookout for conferences where you can hopefully get funding and go and meet some of these people. If not, contact them on social media. Um, people such as Fabazi Etar and uh, Sophia Long, who is involved with We Here. And um, if you hit me up, I can try to put you in contact with some of these folk. Okay. And then I I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Maria. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, oh all right, and then it looks like um, we have one more question here. So Terry's asking um, on the difference between the archivist and the curator. Um, <laughs> Can you say something? Um, I, this is a, I, I, I would say they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, right. uh, you know, I, I, I think archivist refers to a particular set of professional standards around, you know, description and, um, um, you know, in, encoding of information. It, I, I think it's a very technical distinction uh, for the most part, uh, but they do reflect in the way, you know, things are described and accessed. So whereas an archive might be described and accessed as a collection, as a, as a discrete collection with a particular provenance, a curator may be more interested um, in sort of uh, artifactual evidence inherent in discrete objects, right? So a curator might deal more with individual books or individual manuscripts, whereas an archivist may be more keen on something like organizational records or the personal papers of, a, of an artist or a writer or something like that. So um, it, it, it is somewhat granular, but um, it does have sort of far-reaching uh, consequences for the way the work looks that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so that arch uh, archives would deal primarily um, with records and with special uh, like uh, written um, records that aren't published. Um, a lot of published materials, books, um, uh, don't fall in the purview of, arch of, of like um, purely archival archives. definition. Yes, but um, it's important to know that special collections is this hybrid space where you have different types of material. You have um, published media books. You have 
physical records, archives, and you also have manuscript material. So it's, it's a hybrid space that can be curators um, deal with organization but also online. So. Okay, so it's just after the hour, um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And the presenters did offer up their email addresses on the slide, so um, I don't want to volunteer them, but um, if you have questions that were not able to be answered, um, feel free to, to, to take advantage of that. Um, again, we do have the slides linked in this um, notes section, and um, the recording will be posted online. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to all of our presenters for their time today and uh, for everyone who attended. Thank you, and uh, hey, thanks. thanks for everyone for showing up. Yes, same here. Thanks to everybody for attending thank and you. to my co-presenters as well yeah. <laughs> for doing such a great job. And again, reach out to us. And we're here to help and, yes. and support your network. We're, we're here. <laughs> yes. All right, sounds good. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Okay, bye-bye.